on the campus here, roughly 1,100 of them are involved in some sort of musical activity. And I suspect you'll probably hear all of them over here the next two days. One other bit of housekeeping announcements here before I get underway. One thing that I neglected to do was to make you aware of the opening reception of the Paul Grandland retrospective show in the Hillstrom Art Museum. This is at six o'clock. One of the continuing benefits of working at this institution has been the opportunity to walk by Paul Grandland's statues every day. And as many of you know, Paul passed away a few weeks ago. And uh, this is a wonderful show put together uh, to remember his work. And so I highly recommend that you stop in uh, during a break sometime and just take a look. At this point, I think we're ready for our next speaker. And I'd like to call Dr. John Grinnell from our biology department up to the podium here uh, to introduce Peter and Everett Rosemary Grant. John is our animal behaviorist here on our biology staff. And uh, he's best known for his research work. He studies the roars of lions. So. Thanks, Tim. When Charles Darwin left the Galapagos in 1835, he took with him collections of the birds and tortoises he had found in the five weeks that he was there. He'd made similar collections at other ports of Carl in his five-year voyage around the world, but contrary to legend, he didn't attach any particular importance to his Galapagos collections at that time. It was only in looking back to a place he would never revisit that he began to realize what he had missed. Specialists in England declared his Galapagos collections to be species new to science. The birds he thought were a mix of warblers, blackbirds, and wrens were actually all a variable lot of finches. With this newfound knowledge, he reflected in his memoir that the finches were the most singular of any in the archipelago, he wrote, and that in the 13 species of ground finches, a nearly perfect gradation may be traced from a beak extraordinarily thick to one so fine that it may be compared to that of a warbler. I very much suspect, he wrote, that certain members of this species are confined to certain islands. And one might really fancy, he wrote as well, that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. This was his mystery of mysteries the origin of species. You might imagine then that years later when he finally presented his ideas on evolution by natural selection in his book, The Origin of Species, he would give the Galapagos finches an honored spot. In fact, he never once mentioned them. Why? He was baffled by this nearly perfect gradation of variation. In these finches, a beak that could fit on a warbler grades into the beak of a sparrow which grades into the beak of a cardinal. And they were all eating the same foods, or so Darwin and researchers that followed him to the Galapagos observed. In fact, in 1935, 100 years after Darwin's visit to these islands, the ornithologist Percy Lowe declared that the beak of, the beak of Darwin's finches offered no scope for natural selection. In other words, he was saying, the shape and size of these birds' beaks made no difference to their survival or reproduction. We know differently now. In the introductory biology and evolution text that sit on my shelves, I counted nine of them the other day, the beak of the finch is presented as the classic case study of evolution shaping and reshaping a biological trait in response to ecological challenges. Where Darwin too thought that evolution would be too slow to see, in his words, except in the lapse of ages, we now hold up his finches as examples of evolution happening before our eyes, season to season, that we can watch. We know this now because of the phenomenal work of our next speakers, Drs. Peter and Rosemary Grant, who for 30 years have watched season to season, year after year, the changing fates and shapes of Darwin's finches. 
Since they first went to the Galapagos in 1973, the Grants have acquired a nearly God's eye view of these finches. For many years, they have known each individual bird on the island of Daphne Major, what it eats, if it survives, who it mates with, and what traits they pass on to their offspring, and how faithfully. They have made fundamental contributions to our understanding of the role of natural selection and of culture in speciation in how populations that share similar resources evolve to be different, in how hybridization affects a population's evolution, and even in the basic idea of what a species is. They have demonstrated what you can learn if you look carefully enough for long enough. For much of the time they are conducting this groundbreaking research, they are also raising their daughters, Nicola and Talia, who essentially grew up in the Galapagos, grabbing the children's violins and schoolwork, the family would head off for another season off the coast of Ecuador. Peter says that, in this, that this was an experience that neither daughter now would trade for anything. And in fact, their younger daughter Talia now lives in the Galapagos with her husband and two children. Doctors Peter and Rosemary Grant are currently both professors at Princeton University. Together they have accumulated too many honors for me to list now, but they include the E.O. Wilson Prize of the American Society of Naturalists, the Charles Darwin Foundation Millennial Medal for Conservation in Galapagos, the Wildlife Society's Wildlife Publication Award for their book on the large cactus finch, and most recently, an award given by the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley for contributions to scientific natural history, an award given only three times in the last 20 years, the Grinnell Medal. Please join me in welcoming Drs. Peter and Rosemary Grant. Well, that was a superb introduction, and I feel like saying, uh, now for the details, followed by the questions. That was uh, the framework, for, indeed, for what we will be talking about. But first uh, things first, um, Rosemary and I thank the organizers uh, very much for the opportunity to come here and address um, an enormous audience on a, just a wonderful occasion. And uh, once again, I'm going to thank John for that introduction, for allowing us jointly, the committee and John, allowing us to come here and talk about Darwin's finches for four hours. I think you said four, didn't you, John? <laughs> well, the theme of this conference, the story of life, is a very broad one. The story of Darwin's finch life is a much narrower theme, and it's the story of the origin of species and their multiplication. It's told in the language of, that was invented by Darwin, by Wallace, and by Mendel. And it's a story that took place, takes place uh, over approximately three million years. It's a story that could be told with other organisms, from bats to bees, from fruit flies to fungi, even humans, as we'll be hearing tomorrow. But the Darwin's finch telling has the advantage that some parts of the story are exceptionally clear. Even though there are no fossils that we can work with, the islands are still in their original state, the vegetation on some of the islands is pristine, and no species of the finches has become extinct as a result of human activity. Furthermore, there are traces of the Darwin's finch history in their molecules. And with regard to the environment, we can reconstruct what has happened in the past from a knowledge of geology, from a knowledge of plant communities, and from a knowledge of the other species of animals that inhabit the Galapagos with them, and finally from a knowledge of climate and climate change. So, putting all these things together is the scientific equivalent of the oral tradition of storytelling. So the story is going to be told in two parts. I shall start, and then Rosemary will follow. Um, 
each story has a beginning, even if a story doesn't have uh, necessarily an end, and this one doesn't. I'm going to uh, introduce the beginning, run through the stages of the radiation, the early, the middle, the late stages of the radiation, before addressing the issue of how species multiply. Then I will be talking about evolution actually occurring under observation when the environment changes, this will be echoing some of the things you heard this morning from Niles Eldridge, but whereas his accent, his way of talking is a New York accent, mine is strictly New Jersey. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to guess where Rosemary comes from when she takes over uh, in that same section on evolution when the environment changes, and then she will discuss with you how barriers to interbreeding between species arise and how they're maintained. And then finally, she will discuss this enigmatic phenomenon of hybridization between species. You might call this, you might think of this as a failure on the part of the barriers, but whether it's a failure or otherwise, it's very revealing about how normally those barriers operate. So the story begins, as I said, before between two and three million years ago with the arrival on the Galapagos Islands of some finches. The date of two, three to, two to three million years ago is established on the base, basis of a comparison of the mitochondrial DNA uh, between Darwin's finches and what we can recognize as possible ancestral species or relatives of ancestral species on the mainland. And here is such one, a bird in the genus Tiaris, uh, it's a tanager, a seed-eating tanager. The uh, identity of where they came from is simply geographical proximity. They came from, let us say, Ecuador, but we don't know where, somewhere on the mainland, over to the Galapagos Islands, a distance of 900 kilometers. And while I have this picture up on the screen, I will just make a note of where Cocos Island is because that will come into the story in uh, a few moments. So the Galapagos are a very remote place for birds to arrive at. 900 kilometers from the mainland and moving imperceptibly east, south, east towards the continent, never having been connected to the continent before. So colonization is an improbable event. Well, improbable events probably arise in improbable circumstances. What might those circumstances have been to allow finches to travel such a large distance and hit this target of land? Well, any answer to that question must be speculative, even if rooted in modern information. The modern information that we have tells us something about dispersal of finches in the Galapagos archipelago now. And we know that dispersal is greatest under two conditions. One is following an El Nino year of abundance of rain, a high degree of pro productivity in the plant communities, finches breed, build up in numbers, and then they overdo it. There are too many finches for the amount of food, and they fly within the large islands and from one island to another on some occasions. That's one set of circumstances. The other one is when there are volcanic eruptions of an island burning the forests and causing finches to flee for their lives. So our speculative answer to the question of how they got there in the first place runs something like this. Volcanic activity in the Pacific slope of the Andes between two and three million years ago uh, caused uh, forest fires to burn through the spewing forth of molten lava. And uh, destruction of the forest eventually was followed by its regeneration, probably a very thick growth of the forest. Birds would have uh, increased in numbers in this regenerated growth. And then probably there would have been yet further volcanic activity, more burning of the forest. And now there are hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of birds milling around in the coastal region trying to escape the flames, the smoke, and being burnt and some of them would have gone out to sea and kept going ahead of a cloud of smoke and uh, 
may be very hot fragments of um, spewed forth material, and arrived at the Galapagos. Not just finches may be, but finches were certainly amongst them, as we know, with hindsight. So that's how the uh, Galapagos, we think, were colonized in the first place. And when the finches arrived there, they encountered an environment, this is a very important point for what I have to say from now on, the finches encountered an environment that was not the same as today's. So the bottom right-hand panel shows you the, uh, uh, the distribution of islands in the archipelago nowadays, and the top left-hand panel shows what it was like uh, three million years ago. Only five islands, if we've reconstructed this correctly. And between that time, from three million years ago to the present time, the number of islands increased as a result of volcanic outpourings from a hot spot. I'm going to indicate it here. It's under the modern island of Fernandina. So picture it this way, the plate upon which these islands is moving east-south-eastwards, every now and again that plate is punctured by uh, volcanic outpour uh, molten lava outpourings and new islands are formed. So you can consider this island of San Cristobal as your marker. Uh, two million years ago, it was over here. One million years ago, it was over here, well away from its point of origin, and there it is today. Nowadays, there are many more islands than there were three million years ago. Not only that, the climate wasn't the same. Here is a summary of global temperature change over the last four to five million years. Now, the way to read this without looking at all of the details is uh, interglacial refers to relatively warm conditions and glacial refers to relatively cool conditions. And uh, four million years ago, the temperature was something like this on average globally as uh, deduced from a variety of sources and gradually declined with increases in the fluctuation taking place, particularly over the last one million years ago. Our point of interest is two to three million years ago, somewhere in this vicinity here, where locally, presumably, as well as globally, the temperatures were higher than they are now. And finally, according to some theoreticians, the El Nino phenomenon, you're probably all familiar with that because it's newsworthy every roughly four years. The El Nino phenomenon, up to the time that glaciation began somewhere around about two and three quarter million years ago, was a permanent feature of this part of the Pacific Ocean. So with all this information put together, we suspect that the environment that the finches uh, encountered when they first reached the Galapagos was more like what uh, Cocos Island now has, that is a rainforest right from the coast all the way up to the peak. Nowadays, the Galapagos has the same temperatures as uh, Cocos Island, but it has much less rainfall, except at high elevations in the most extreme El Nino years. So the finches arrived in uh, an environment somewhat like that, and they looked somewhat like this a generalized seed-eating form, almost certainly. And the first steps in the radiation, this is now right at the beginning, the first evolutionary changes, took a bird that looked somewhat like that into a direction, we believe, given the nature of the habitat on Cocos Island, took the ancestral finch in a direction of exploiting uh, flowers for nectar and for pollen and small arthropods. In other words, a beak that is much smaller and finer than this general purpose uh, seed crunching beak um, to something like this. This is, on the basis of molecular data, the derivative of the uh, oldest species on the island. We call it the warbler finch. Now, it has uh, a very different appearance from what you saw beforehand, and then, this species, or its ancestor, strictly speaking, split into two lineages. This is the derivative, the modern form of one of those lineages, and this is the modern form of the other one. I'm going to give a few names. 
the first one was, is called Olivacea, this one is Fusca. I might use switch from English to the scientific names uh, without intending to. Um, these two lineages anyway were the product of the first split. The, the radiation began with that first division. Nowadays, the Olivacea group uh, live uh, on high islands at high alti uh, altitude, and this one lives on other islands, uh, generally at low altitude. Now, because they're so similar, because they're so different from all of the mainland relatives, and because they're also so different from any of the subsequently formed species, we believe that uh, the initial steps in the radiation uh, were taken by birds adapting very strongly to this highly unusual niche of nectar eating and pollen eating. Either on the Galapagos, which is our best guess, or possibly on the mainland, and it was the mainland forms that got over to the island and then split into these two. Regardless of where that initial divergence took place, it's secondary to, uh, in importance to what I have to say. Nowadays, the Olivacea group live in forest at high elevations on those tall islands in the center and the west of the archipelago, and Fusca lives in the low habitat, generally around the coast and somewhat inland from there, uh, cactus and various uh, spiny bushes uh, as, that you can see in the foreground. So that was the beginning. Now, remarkably, all of the subsequent evolutionary radiation of the finches took place from one of those lineages, not from both. Here's a reconstruction of evolutionary history of the group as a whole, based upon an analysis of microsatellite DNA. If I showed you a picture of the phylogeny based upon mitochondrial DNA, a currently more frequently used molecule for examining phylogenetic relationships, you would see almost the identical pattern. Namely, Olivacea right down at the bottom here. The first split separated Olivacea from Fusca. And the remarkable thing, as I said a moment ago, is that it was the Fusca lineage that gave rise to everything else, including the Cocos finch. So let's have a look at some of these products in the early to mid stages of the radiation. One of the species produced differs remarkably from the warbler finch. This is the vegetarian finch. No prizes for guessing what it feeds on. And then this, by contrast, is the single species occurring on Cocos now. It has a beak morphology very similar to the warbler finch. In the later stages of the uh, radiation, ground finches were formed, a group of ground finches referred to in John's introduction. I'm illustrating this group of six species with the largest of them all, the uh, large ground finch, nicknamed by people who work in this area, a flying beak. And then there's another group of species that are called the tree finch group, because they live most of the time up in the tree, trees. And the most famous one of this group is the woodpecker finch, uh, so-called for its excavation of uh, cryptic prey, but it does so with the unique habit of fashioning a tool out of twigs or cactus spines and probing into the crevices to tease out the bee or beetle larvae. So the question is then, how is it that 14 species of finches were derived from the ancestral stock. If the archipelago had had all of the contemporaneous ecological niches in place at the time the ancestral species arrived, then one could think of the process of radiation akin to the filling of boxes with balls, one ball per box. Indeed, this is how the radiation was thought of by our predecessor, David Lack, some 50 or 60 years ago. The process of radiation, therefore, was just a matter of filling in uh, exploitative machines, finches, finch species, into the various ecological niches that were already there. But we know that fundamentally the island environments were not the same when the finches first arrived as they are now, and therefore one has to think of a change taking place, both in the environments and the finches, as the 
uh, Finch evolutionary radiation unfolded. For one thing, as you know already, there were only five islands there at the outset, and more islands were produced uh, uh, subsequently. More islands means more opportunities for evolutionary diversification. Not only that, the climate changed, and that means that the conditions for different species of plants to live there changed. As a result of that, then insects also were able, new insects were able to establish, and so on. So rather than all of the contemporaneous niches being present at the outset, the number of niches increased as the number of islands increased, and the finches evolved to take advantage of a changing environment. Again, echoes of what Niles Eldridge spoke to us about this morning. A facilitating factor, and a probably a very important facilitating factor, was the absence of closely related species. So now moving to the last stages of the radiation, um, with these climatic changes taking place uh, rapidly from cool to hot, um, the vegetation moved up and down altitudinally, the large islands shown um, in this not very good uh, cartoon uh, with the contrast between a tree finch zone up in a high altitude and a ground finch zone down at the bottom. That, those changes may have resulted in the complete disappearance of one of the habitats and the complete disappearance of the species that occupied it, at least on some islands uh, for some short period of time. Here, for example, is a moist upland uh, habitat uh, photograph, the Scalasia forest. The Scalasia is a relative of the daisy in the daisy family, and it's undergone an evolutionary radiation itself. This species may have gone extinct locally on some of the islands during those climatic uh, vicissitudes. Now I change from circumstances to causes and ask in more detail how this multiplication or radiation process occurred. And that question can be reduced to the simpler one of how do we explain how two species evolved from a single species? I'm showing the standard allopatric model of speciation as an answer, or at least a framework for answering that question diagrammatically here, with the arrival from the uh, continent of the ancestral species to, at San Cristobal in the southeast of the archipelago. The ch choice of islands for this, by the way, is entirely arbitrary. Followed by colonization of other islands with adaptive change taking place at each stage of this cycle of events and leading ultimately, using the word ultimate in the scientific sense, uh, leading ultimately to coexistence on San Cristobal of two species derived from one. In this case, it's the ancestral species plus a derived form. I could have done it just as well by having it on uh, coexistence being illustrated on Santa Cruz. So the crucial thing about the conditions for coexistence, uh, two crucial uh, conditions, are first of all that the two forms do not compete for resources so intensely that one disappears. And the second one is that they don't interbreed, or if they do, exceedingly rarely. So there has to be an ecological separation and a reproductive separation of these two products of evolutionary diversification. And I'm going to illustrate how the ecological difference arises through adaptive change at these various allopatric steps in the model. And I'm going to do so with a species I haven't mentioned so far, the sharp beat ground finch, which occurs on six islands. And we're going to see different uh, representatives of this species on different islands. The original habitat at medium to high elevations is this forest of Xanthoxylum. There's only one species of tree shown here. It's a single band of vegetation, and we think it is old. Now, three of the populations live on islands solely in this band, and three others live on lower islands in arid habitat, possibly having colonized the islands when Xanthoxylum was present. And then when the Xanthoxylum disappeared as a result of those climatic fluctuations that I talked about, 
Then they underwent an adaptive change to the local and now new circumstances. So the upland ones have a sharp beak, yes, but it's a fairly blunt one. They feed on mollusks, they feed on arthropods, and when the dry season hits and the food supply declines, they turn their attention to fruits and uh, sometimes seeds. That's the highland type. On one of the low islands, Henevesa in the northeast of the archipelago, they probe into flowers to get nectar and pollen, for which they have an appropriate beak size. On the island of Wolf in the northwest of the archipelago, apparently uniquely on this island, they do some unusual things. They show a great interest in the eggs of seabirds. That interest is um, an, op an ecological opportunity responded to, but it's also driven by the necessity of food scarcity in the dry season. They are versatile as a result of that combination of opportunity and necessity. Here they are apparently queuing up to look at an egg, but what they're trying to do is to break it open, and they resort to interesting behaviors to do that. <laughs> Eventually, this egg will be kicked either against a rock or over a ledge, smash at the bottom, all of the finches flock towards it, and then uh, consume the contents, rich in moisture, but rich in protein. Even more bizarre than that, they feed on blood. They do this by hopping onto the backs of seabirds, appropriately named boobies, and poking, poking at the base of developing wing feathers and drawing blood and drinking it. Almost certainly this is a habit derived from an earlier stage of feeding on hippobosid flies, which feed mosquito-like on the blood of the boobies and run around inside the feathers of the birds. So what the finches essentially have done in going straight for the blood is they've shortened the food chain. And they have long beaks appropriate for this task. So all of that tells us that birds adapt uh, in isolated populations to different food conditions. Now, the role of natural selection is much more secure, securely inferred, if we can actually demonstrate it in contemporary time. And I'm now going to show you evidence for this from a study on the little island of Daphne. It's been successful because the climate, as you see from this figure, changes enormously from El Nino conditions, as indicated here, to La Nina conditions when there's virtually no rain. We started the study in 1973 on this little island of Daphne, right in the middle of the archipelago, banding birds and following their fates. And we found that uh, in 1977, a large number of birds died. In fact, 85% of the medium ground finch population died uh, through a drought, when there was no regeneration of the seed supply. And this is shown in this diagram where an index of body size or beak size is shown on the vertical axis over here. And the average beak depth uh, or body size, doesn't really matter which one is we take as this uh, index of uh, overall size, stays constant across a period of time up to the drought, increases in the drought, and only levels off when the rains resumed in 1978. As a result, not of growth, there was no growth taking place here, but of differential survival. Large birds survive better than small birds as a result of their ability to deal with large and hard seeds that became not absolutely common, but relatively common in the environment as the small seeds were eaten down to a low level of abundance. Now, Darwin's principle of evolution, or his explanation for evolution, required three things. It required variation in a trait, it required inheritance of that variation, and it required natural selection. Given those three conditions, Darwin argued, evolution would take place. I've shown you the evidence for natural selection. What about variation and its inheritance, and how do we put them all together? 
This is the best way that I can do it, although I'm not showing inheritance here. What I am showing is a reflection of inheritance, and I'm now going to explain. In the top panel, you see the distribution of beak depths. Let's see here, on the horizontal axis, it's beak depth. The uh, frequency distribution of beak depths in the population in 1976. The, the distribution of white bars has within it a distribution of black bars, and the black bars indicate the birds who survived the drought of 77. Clearly, not a random selection. They were above average in size. And let me just point out the average of the population here, before selection, the average after selection, the difference is a measure of natural selection. Inheritance, as I say, is not demonstrated here. Inheritance is the association through genetic transfer between generations. But it is reflected in the fact that the offspring of the 76th generation were the same as the parents before selection had happened. Well, the, the uh, survivors of 1976 bred in 1978. And those offspring, likewise, were very close to the average size of the parents that produce them. Now evolution is the difference, the change, from one generation to the next. And it is measured by taking the first generation before selection and the second generation after selection and measuring the difference. What I've just indicated is the two points of the evolutionary change that took place the starting point and the finishing point. That difference is a measure of evolution. And now I'm going to very quickly go through a series of slides to show you that when the environment changes, so does the direction of natural selection. And the short summary statement of this is that under the very wet conditions produced by an incredible El Nino in 1983, the environment changed from basically a large seed island to a small seed island. And under these conditions, small beaked birds had the selective advantage. Very quickly then, to, uh, here's the visual overview. The plateau, so-called, of our island of Daphne, with no leaves on the trees at the back and very little vegetation on the ground in the foreground in the dry season. In the wet season, the trees are leaved, and in the foreground, you see low-growing plants, including this one, Tribulus, which made all the difference between survival and non-survival of the finches in 1977. Because this is the one that produces large and hard seeds, actually groups of uh, components of a fruit, which is woody and spiny and obviously uh, difficult to get at, but the finches do get at them. They tear and twist at the wood to get into the seed locule to pull out the seeds uh, on the in, inner su surface of the fruits. And that's the view of El Nino in 83, with grasses and herbs growing up and smothering the tribulus plant. And the rain kept going. It kept going for eight months. Vines grew everywhere, smothered the cactus bushes, almost smothered the bushes that the birds were nesting in, so it was difficult for us to find the nests, and completed the job later. They just simply disappeared from sight. And even in the dry season afterwards, you could see the aftermath of the El Nino effect with all these vines draped over trees and bushes. And that's not all, which Rosemary will tell you about now. was talking about um, the selection happening over the drought of 1977 here and when the seed bank was made up of large hard seeds so that the um, birds with um, large body size and large beaks survived, 80% um, of the birds with smaller, um, uh, smaller body size and small beaks died and then the, he covered the enormous El Nino event of 1983, which completely altered the ecological conditions of the island. 
and caused the island to go from a large hard seed island to a small soft seed island, so that when we came to the drought of um, 1985, um, the seed bank was made up of these small soft seeds, and this time um, there was a lot of mortality. The large bills birds died, and the ones that survived were the smaller birds with um, small bills. But as you can see, um, across um, the 30 years that we have studied these finches, the climate has continued to oscillate backwards and forwards from extremely wet years um, down to droughts. We have um, a two-year drought here, um, another drought in um, 1996, and then even this year was a drought. So what happened to the finches? Did they continue to um, be subjected to natural selection with evolutionary responses to natural selection? And the answer is yes, indeed they did. Natural selection occurred repeatedly. Now down um, this um, column is um, Geospiza fortis, the medium ground finch. Down this column is um, Geospiza scandens, the cactus finch, and the x-axis shows the the 30 years that we studied um, the finches. And you can see that in body size in both um, Fortis and Scandens, natural selection occurred repeatedly and oscillated in direction as it did in beak size and as it did um, substantially in beak shape. So what was the consequence of this? Did it just oscillate backwards and forwards so that the birds in average or mean body size, beak size, and beak shape are just exactly the same as they were when we began the study in 1973, or has there been a change over these 30 years? So to answer that question, oops, sorry. <laughs> to answer that question, um, we looked at um, the mean trait values across these um, 30 years, and this um, framework is exactly the same with um, Fortis down this column, Scandens down this column, and we took our 1973 starting point, which is here, and we looked at the mean trait values, and we took the 95% confidence limits across the years. So if we look at Fortis and, oops, um, <laughs> and um, body size, then um, if it had stayed the same, the body size would have just fluctuated and backwards and forwards um, in between, sorry, this line um, here, in between these two lines. And as we see clearly, it has not. Um, body size today, or in 2002, is um, significantly smaller than it was in 1973, and exactly the same with Scandin's Body size is significantly smaller than it was in 1973. Beak size is interesting because in Fortis, it um, increased and over the selection episode that Peter told you about, and then it decreased. And so now today, it really is the same size as it was in 1973. In Scandens, beak size is smaller than it was in 1973. Beak shape is a really remarkable one that has really changed substantially. In Fortis, beak shape is significantly more pointed, and I'm going to say right now, more Scandens-like than it was in 1973. This is a big difference. And likewise in Scandens, um, bill shape size now is significantly blunter so more fortis-like than it was in 1973. In fact, the two species have converged on each other in bill shape, and they have gone 25% of the way towards each other. So if you keep this in your mind, um, this will become clear why this happened and the consequences of this um, later on. So what we can say at this point is that the, um, the natural selection on Daphne has um, given us four le lessons. It is an observable, measurable, and interpretable process in a natural environment. It oscillates in direction, it occurs when the environment changes, and it has evolutionary consequences. But with all this natural selection that is going on, and 
we all know that natural selection requires genetic variation if there is going to be an evolutionary response. So the question really becomes, how is this genetic variation maintained? The other question that this raises, and I just told you that these finches in bill shape at least are um, converging each, in, towards each other, is how do these species coexist? And this question can be, or these questions can be answered if we ask what is the reproductive barrier between these closely related species and um, is this barrier leaky? Or if it is leaky, under what circumstances is it leaky? The two finches um, that I'm going to talk about because they're the two most common finches on Daphne is, as I have been talking about before, is Scandens, the cactus finch, and it is a finch of about 22 um, grams, and it, you can see here it has a long, relatively thin beak. The um, Fortis, the ground finch, um, is a smaller bird, it is 18 grams, and has a much blunter um, bill. So the two differ in morphology, they also differ in song. Um, Fortis, the ground finch, sings a rendering of mostly moosely, mostly moosely, and the cactus finch has a long drawn out um, song, which is cha 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 If I took any of you onto Daphne um, for five minutes, you'll be able to tell the difference in song between these two birds. It's very distinct and very discreet. However, the birds are similar in ways. Um, they build the same sort of nest. Um, they look the same as far as plumage goes. Males are black, females are brown. And as far as we can tell, they have the same sort of courtship behavior. We have not been able to measure any differences in courtship behavior. Um, so first of all, we asked, well, um, are the birds or are the birds capable of discriminating between their own and their other species um, on the bounds of morphology? We can tell the difference, can the birds tell the difference? So we did some tests and this was um, with Lorene Ratcliffe. Um, we took museum specimens, so they were dead specimens, um, stuffed, and we put two female specimens, one fortis, one scandons, on either end of this rod and we put the females in um, a posture which was soliciting copulation. And this absolutely makes the birds go bananas. In fact, it was so evocative that we had to cover these um, specimens with a handkerchief, put them on the, ends of the, um, on the ends of the rod, and then just back off and take off the handkerchiefs and back off. And the birds responded beautifully. We did, had to do this, of course, in the breeding season. They wouldn't have responded otherwise. Um, they responded beautifully and they came in and they fluttered and they quartered and they even got to the point of jumping up on the back of the bird, the stuffed specimen and um, completing the whole process. And they did um, absolutely um, discriminate between Scandens and Fortis. There was no, um, no question about this. In all the tests they did, they went uh, straight to, the, to their own species. So they can tell, they can discriminate on the basis of morphology. However, they can also discriminate on the basis of song. And so we did a series of playback experiments where we did not have the museum mounts. So we did not have, um, we only had one stimulus, which was um, the vocal stimulus. And once again, if you play back a Scandin song, Scandin comes booming into the loudspeaker, flies constantly backwards and forwards over the top. And if you play a Fortis song, Fortis will do the same, but Scandens will completely ignore it. So they only respond to their own species song. And once again, this was a very clear-cut experiment. Any of you could go on to Daphne and repeat this experiment, as actually some people have done, and they get, you get absolutely this clear-cut result. Now, it turns out that song is very, very important. In this case, I would say song is even more important than morphology. So what do we know about song? We know from work done by Bob Bowman in the early 60s when he was able to take birds away and take them back to California and do experiments on them 
that these birds learn their song in a, in a short sensitive period early in life. And this is from day 10 to about day 30. Now it's an interesting period because it coincides with the last few days in the nest and the time when they're outside the nest being fed as fledglings by their parents and mainly by their father. So it's at this time they learn the song. We also know from repeated, we are constantly taking um, recordings of birds and we know that once they have um, learnt their song and sung their song, they retain that same song for life. And we have literally hundreds and hundreds of recordings. I have chosen four here for two reasons. One, to show that the songs of any of these birds do not change across years. Um, and the other one to show that in this framework of mostly moosely, there are variations. So you can actually um, follow, um, follow the, the birds and their individual songs. And what we find is that most of these birds sing an exact rendering of their father's song. And this is, um, which is not surprising because they learn in this short sensitive period, the bird they hear most is their father singing, and so it's not surprising that they learn the exact rendering of their father's song. So if this is the great-great-grandfather, the great-grandfather, um, grandfather, father, son, you can see that they all have basically the similar song down this pedigree, and 80 to 90% of pedigrees are like this um, on Daphne. We do get some exceptions. Sometimes the birds sing the song of the natal neighbor, as this one did, and not the father. And, um, and you get some situations, as I have shown on this side of the diagram, where you don't get the exact copying of the father's song. Exactly the same happens in Scandans. This is a Scandan song, and you can see that the son sings a song rather similar to its father. Um, here, son, father, son, father, and in this one it is different. So it's about the same, about 80 or 90% of birds do this and um, about 15% um, of birds um, actually copy their natal neighbors or another bird's um, song. Um, this copying of song is extraordinarily um, you, you can see this, it's extraordinarily consistent. And there's one anecdote, it's often these anecdotes that really sort of show you that this is true. And one of these birds, the father, got a cactus bind through its throat. So it sang a very croaky song. And this happened in the late 1970s. And even um, it's, um, well, it's great, I imagine at this time, it's its great, great, great grandchildren. Some of them are now singing this croaky song, so you still have the remnants of this croaky song on the island, which has been faithfully copied from the croaky father to the son and onwards. So I've talked about um, males. Now let's see about females. Females do not sing. It's only the males that sing, but nevertheless, they are very seem to be very much aware of song differences between the species. We have 392 fortis where both the father and the mate songs have been recorded. And so of these 392, 378 did what they should do, which is mate with their own species, but 12 of them mated with um, a small ground finch, Fuliginosa, which there are a few of these on the island and these 12 mated with the wrong species. This little bird is a 14 gram bird compared to about an 18 gram bird. And the remarkable thing about these 12 males that um, these females mated with is that they sang a fortis song. So they were mating according to song type um, and not according to morphology. Um, we do not know about these two, unfortunately. I wish we did. We don't know the history of those. But we do have 90 Scandans where we have the father and the mate song um, recorded. And we were extremely interested because four of these Scandans females were born from a Scandans father that sang a fortress song. So we were 
watching who they should mate with. And sure enough, they all mated with Fortus. So they all hybridized. They all mated according to song type and not according to morphology. So we now have the question, why is it that some of these males sing the other species' song? Well, we know, fortunately, because we've been on the island and we've got all these birds banded and we're able to follow them, um, we know, fortunately, the answer to at least some of these, and most of them. Um, and one is that sometimes Scanlins comes and takes over the nest of a fortress. Usually when this happens, they turf out all the eggs, but occasionally they will leave one egg behind. That egg will hatch out um, perhaps a day before the Scandans clutch. It will be a true fortress, and, um, both genetically, we can tell this from the, the blood, the DNA that we can take, and also in morphology. But it will sing its foster father's song. It will sing a Scandan song. Other cases are when the male dies and the young grow up in the nest singing the song that they hear most, which is their nearest neighbor. And if that neighbor happens to be another species, then it will sing the other species' song. Um, and then other times, there are two nests very close together. The dominant male of a larger species sing, will sing more frequently, chase the other male constantly away. The true father may have very little chance to sing, and the birds in the nest learn this other species' song. So all those things we have seen and documented happening. So the next question is then, um, how fit are these hybrids relative to their parental species? Now, in the first part of the study, from 1973 up into 1983, none of these hybrids survived to reproduce. Um, they are produced at about 1% of the breeding population or less. And the same rate has occurred throughout our whole 30 years of study. So very few hybrids are produced. But nevertheless, between 1973 and up to 1983, none survived to reproduce. This could have been, as we thought, because there was genetic incompatibility, or it could be, be because the hybrids being intermediate in bill size did not have the appropriate food um, they were unable to eat the large, hard, trivial seeds. We saw them try, but never saw them succeed. And they took about three times longer to crack open an Apuntia seed than the um, Scandans, the cactus finch, did. However, after 1983, when the island turned into a small seed island and the seed bank was full of small, soft seeds, the hybrids with their intermediate bills survived, and they survived long enough um, to, to breed, they did not breed with each other, but they did back cross. So then the question comes, is there any genetic, incom genetic incompatibility at all? And so what we did, I, I'll just go back, what we did is we took all the birds born in 1983, very few birds um, actually were produced in um, the following years, 1987, a lot of birds were produced, so we took that year as well, and 1991, and we took the cohorts from those three years, and we asked how well did the parental species, Fortis and Scandin, survive? And um, in the 1983 cohort, we had um, 119 Fortis and 553 Scandins, 12 hybrids. And so this is a graph of Fortis and Scandin survival across um, the next um, years until finally um, the, that cohort disappeared. We did the same with 1987 cohort and the same with 1991 cohort. So if the, there had been any genetic incompatibility at all, um, we should have seen the survival of the hybrids coming below, let's try and do this, below these lines. But actually what we found was that they didn't, the, the hybrids survived um, extraordinarily well. They survived as well as, and if not better, than the pure species. Um, this 1991, these were actually the first generation back crossers. They were the first generation hybrids in 1983-87, but the back crossers in 1991, all of which survived very well. They also, although I haven't got a slide to show you, there was also no significant difference between the number of eggs they produced, between the number of um, nestlings and the number of fledglings they produced. 
So there seems to have been no genetic incompatibility um, in the hybrids. It was just that the appropriate food was not available when they were not surviving. So introgression is um, interesting because it follows once again the lines of song. Hybrids do not sing intermediate songs. Song being learnt, um, they sing the song of their father. So if we take this hybrid, this is a Fortis Scandens hybrid with a Fortis father that sang a Scandin song. So he himself sings a Scandin song. He mates with a Scandens female, produces the first back cross generation, which also sings a Scandin song, mates with the Scandins and produces the second back cross generation. And this happens whether this is a male or a female. And the same happens in Fortis. So in introgression increases genetic variation on which the selection can then act. So this explains partly why we get this, um, uh, this pattern of um, selection um, of there being enough genetic variation for selection to have acted over um, this period of 30 years. And also I want you to remind you that this um, hybridization is likely to have been episodic. This El Nino year, which completely altered the, um, in 1983, which completely altered the ecological conditions on the island, um, was a very unique event. Um, in coral cores, it was the most extreme event in um, 400 years. So over that time scale, it has been quite a unique event and has completely caused this um, ecological difference on the island. So we think that possibly these periods when hybrids can survive and back cross has probably been episodic in the past. So in summary, um, to summarize both our talks, the radiation of Darwin's pinchers took place over two to three million years. Um, Somewhere um, the, the first split started about 2.83 million years and as Peter showed you this w could have occurred when the finches first came out of the islands. So we know from these our geological colleagues tell us it was a period of volcanic activity on the mainland. It was also the time when, as Niles Eldridge said, which was a last closure of the Panama Canal and we think that this um, altered, we certainly altered the um, currents and wind patterns and may have had an effect also in bringing the finches out to the Galapagos. Um, over that time, um, 14 species were produced and they were adapted to different ecological niches. Um, 13 species are on the Galapagos, one is on Cocos Island. And environmental change was an important factor we thought at the beginning of the radiation and through the radiation, and we have shown that environmental change is also an important factor today. Our detailed studies on Daphne have shown that populations um, track um, these environmental changes um, through natural selection and evolutionary responses to natural selection. We have seen that significant morphological change can occur over a very short period of time. If you take 30 years as being a short period of time, many of you in the audience will think 30 years is more than a lifetime, but for us it is a, a quite a short period of time. Song, a learnt, culturally transmitted trait, acts as a reproductive barrier between species, and rare misimprinting on song can lead to hybridization and to introgression, that is, genes flowing from one species to another. Now, this, I think, is very important. When the same novel environment drives selection and hybrid survival, introgression increases genetic variation on which selection can act. So the same novel environment was, of course, a change to, um, to soft seed island, to soft seeds, and this was appropriate for hybrid survival, and it also um, drove selection on the pure species as well. But when you get this situation, this reinforcing process can be a really rapid route to change. So in this case, hybridization has um, been a force um, of um, speeding up this um, change. And the 
message we would like to leave you with is that speciation involves an interaction between ecological conditions, genetics, and also learning, which is culturally transmitted. We've talked about biodiversity, and we've talked about extinction, at least Niles did um, this morning. And another message which I hope will resonate with Niles is that neither species nor environments are static entities, but dynamic and constantly changing. And to conserve species and their environments, we must keep them both capable of further change. Thank you.